Warmly welcoming you all back to this our show, Human Humane Architecture on Think Tech Hawaii. Today, we're going to have me, Martin Despang, your host. We're going to have the most important guest ever because without him, we would have had nothing, not a single show. And this is our founding uncle of this program and all the other 29 programs, Jay Fidel. Hi, Jay. Hi, Martin. Nice to see your smiling face, Martin. Yeah. And I, I try to keep it up because it's, it's bittersweet or sweet bitter because this is the second to last show in this uh, reoccurring every week program as all the other ones are. But we, I just watched your nice trailer, you know, regarding the message and saying, you know, it's not the end, but the beginning of something else, even better. So let's reflect on what we've been doing and, and you know, learn, getting better every day, as you always say, rightly so, thinking how, how do we move on from here? So let's just, with this picture, here, recap uh, how this all came about. So about a decade ago, um, I stumbled around because I just came to the island and, uh, and I saw on the, this means journalism, on the title page of the Star Advertiser, they reported and did not criticize so it started out to begin like the problem to saying, oh, we as, you know, the island and the city, we're going to air condition all the schools. And coming from, you know, as some of my clients say, overly critical architectural practice, I, the few people I had gotten to know, I, I sent them an email. One was Howard Wig, And he said, hey, you want to discuss this on air? And I said, whatever. So show quote up there, this is when he had me on the show. These were the luxurious days, Jay, of 45 minutes airtime with three breaks, uh, two breaks, and we even went over time, as you can see there, five minutes. That's how excited we got about it. You took your chance before I walked out of the studio, and he said, okay, you're going to do a show about architecture. Uh, well, you do 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 show about the built environment because, as we show quote below that one, there was a previous one that we called urban transcendent. So we is you know that was a decade ago. The picture, the big picture, was only a few months ago, uh, weeks ago, not even two months ago. That was the the annual party uh, around Christmas coinciding. So the people you can see there, the guy with the hat is missing out on us because he thinks he has something better to do. So you can take that. You know we love you. So he worked at the Bishop Museum and has to do a, what did he call it, a documentary today. So we're missing out on him. And so um, I just, the, what, what we wrote down here is the people who actually talk about the built environments are lawyers, as Jay Fidel and Carol Mon Lee. Is also engineers because, um, you know, Howard is one educated at Berkeley in the 60s. I hold up my degree, my diploma engineer architect degree to say there is actually some science thinking, sense making in, in architecture, which often gets abused with a BS of Beaux-Arts. And and uh, there is also historians, what the Soto is. So there's actually no one educated as a journalist to talk about the built environment and architecture. How is that, Jay? Hmm. We need to cover it more. It's really important that we infuse some sophistication into the public, the public view of things, uh, the public sensibility in Hawaii, because we've missed that since the early yeah. 20th century. We sort of gave it up somewhere along the line in, in, in about 1915. Oh, that's a while ago. <laughs> <laughs> and so us now being, you know, 10 years, and you, of course you, you know, me, it's been a decade when you snapped me, but you've been doing this um, out of your law firm as radio back then. And did I ever tell you how much I love you? And, you know, the reason that I never told you might have been because what you also are or initially have been this lawyer I had on is the profession I uh, I'm not the most fondest of with because <laughs> the other gentlemen here, gentlemen on the right, Bandit Kanihakon and Richard Lowe are planners and fellow architects. Bandit, in fact, is the best architect. I think if there would be a journalist, you know, here. 
educated as a journalist, he could very objectively say Bandit is the best. We all all got screwed over for talking overly critical practice many times by some clients, by lawyers. So you're very, very honored to be that exception to that rule that we don't like lawyers too much. So that, that being said, um, you know, we uh, are thinking now who is actually uh, in other cases, in case of other cities, uh, you know, doing what we have been trying to do. And that got us, gets us back to now we're older than, you know, you started it, you know, more than two decades ago uh, as, as think tech and then before that radio. So we might allow ourselves some senior moments, which we both had speaking about myself. Because um, you immediately at the beginning confronted me with uh, one of your heroes in that in that genre, and I was blanking on. And next page was picking the wrong one, but let's start with that one. That's the one I remember because we were talking New York Times. So here we have uh, the one that all that came to my mind immediately, who is Paul Goldberger, and he writes for the New York Times, and he is educated um, as a journalist. And he is also in the academe, which is my other head, as been working for the School of Architecture and educating the emerging generations. So is Paul Goldberger. Every School of Architecture actually affords itself a history theory person. And um, that one then takes over that. In everywhere but in America also, then everyone else comes from overly critical practice. That's, that's a little different here. So um, we already see there might be some, you know, kind of conflict here as, you know, America does it and maybe even as, you know, in, in general, maybe even more specific how our School of Architecture up at UH does it. But let's go to the guy uh, that you had in mind. So next page, who is that? Who's your hero in that field? Oh, Michael Kimmelman um, from the New York Times Architectural Critic and Yale. Kimmelman, you, uh, uh, Kim, you can find Kimmelman on YouTube. You can find some of his uh, his talks, and he's, he's a great speaker, and he will show, at least he has shown me, the, the inside of the architectural mind, as you have. Yeah, they, so now we do the math, you know, we're talking about New York City, which has like eight times the population of the city and county of Honolulu, so people might defend themselves. Well, if you have more than one, you know, in New York City, and maybe you have like nine, that justifies, you know, that we should have won, or it, it excuses that we have none, which is not the excuse, right? Either quantitatively or qualitatively. So Michael is also educated, as none of us is, as a journalist, and he dedicates itself to, and he also teaches at Columbia University in the School of Architecture as the theory, history guy. This is very important. Which of his topics, Jay, which I just, again, Google, uh, uh, you know, snapshot here at the bottom uh, left, is is his key topic that gets you the most going? Public spaces. Um, I've seen uh, some talks by him about public spaces and how they were important in, in classical Greece and uh, classical Rome and how they permitted the development of democracy there, how they allowed people to talk to each other, to engage with each other, to argue with each other. And uh, this kind of dialogue uh, was critical in both of those places for the development of the democracies that they had. Um, and it's still important. And it should be in every, in every city, in every community. And if one is planning a given community, one must plan for open spaces, public spaces. So that's uh, Michael Kimmelman's main main point for me. It is. So let's now switch to the other side that we now have the chance through you having chosen me, uh, uh, hijack me from my other profession, right? Um, let's go to the next slide. Because what's the benefit of for architecture to have you know architectural criticism in the public? So speaking about time flying by, some of us you know staying as beautiful as they were as you, 
But this gentleman here used to have hair down there. And that was uh, about a quarter of a century ago. That was me uh, showing up in what's the equivalent to the Star Advertiser, the main newspaper, the print version. And it was uh, with something that is uh, public space um, in, in, in a way, as, as, we, as, we, as we saw it. And it was uh, when we had the expo in, in 2000 in Hanover, which all of a sudden was bringing, you know, the spotlight on my sleepy little hometown of Hanover. All of a sudden we were out there, you know, in the world. What is the equivalent of in Hawaii, you might say, if, you know, on behalf of DeSoto, uh, when he was a kid and all of a sudden statehood came. I mean, the, the good part of it that he saw, you know, all of a sudden, that was the coolest state that America snapped and sort of added to his uh, collection. And, you know, he took advantage of it that all of a sudden it wasn't in the middle of nowhere anymore, most remote landmass, you know, anywhere in the world, but it was all, all of a sudden in the middle of everywhere. So these events, you know, could and should and have boosted, you know, uh, cities and, and, and public life. Well, in this case here, that was kind of a, a bumpy start to begin with, because my dear father, Gunther, uh, an architect, um, had um, uh, gotten um, in, in trouble with, the, with a client because the client didn't think he was cool enough anymore. There's always the cool factor. He got obsessed with, and it, it's the guy in the middle there next to the Hannover Allgemeine sign, and he basically thought Frank O'Gary the all-American architect, was cooler. And so um, he uh, even didn't really want to, didn't want my dad anymore. But the lady to the left, at the top, the second to the left, uh, was the head of the city planning department and the DPP and everything in one, in one hand, uh, Uta Bock of Greece. And they were both the clients for adding a new line of public transportation to the expo, which when the expo was gone, would then, you know, uh, connect these neighborhoods that were formerly not connected to public transportation. So it was an invited, a limited invited competition. It was like the Oscar, then there was the winner is, and oh, it was these guys anymore. It was the not cool desk bang guy. And my father had sensed that, and I was at the end of school, and he asked me if I'd like to do it together with him because he wasn't really that interested anymore, and we did it together, and we won it. And from there on, we sort of did it against the client. Ironically, that little Gary Tower and Frank was such a nice guy. There was once Martin Haas, who's a partner, or was a partner with Danish architect, uh, one of our most prominent uh, German architects, if not the most prominent. He once said he went to an AIA. You talked about AIA. The American Institute of Architects, there was a national meeting of all the hotshots, and they were all there. And Martin said, you know, I've never seen, it was like in a zoo with dysfunctional, you know, animals, one more than the other, all these divas and architects. And he said, the only nice guy was actually Frank Gehry. My dad can confirm that, what, because when that little project that the client then wanted to do with Frank, that they took away from my dad to begin with, when that was open, the opening ceremony, they flew Frank in. Frank saw a name tag of my dad and came and hugged him and then saying, hey, you're my hero because you did all the dirty work, you know, the permitting and all that bullshit. And all I needed to do is twist the neck of that guy building because that's what he does. <laughs> so a really nice guy, really nice and collegial. And we actually get back to that point of collegiality in architectural reporting, you know, later on. So um, the guy on the second to the right is, uh, is uh, a journalist that the Hannover Allgemeine, which is that main newspaper, afforded itself. He wrote every Saturday in a feuilleton about the built environment. He did not write that particular article down there, unfortunately, but again, the article very much helped, of course, the head of the city planning department to make that case. You know, that was a public decision through a blind jury, through an anonymous jury, an objective jury, and we basically should to do that. And so that. You know, being said, um, Jochen Stockmann is the guy's name. He, at some point then, you know, after the expo, he left. And what a big loss for Hanover. Ever since a, a local guy, as much as we have one here, 
names don't matter, you know, they took over and they just don't have the horizon that, you know, these really kind of professional and dedicated basically people have. I also throw in the show quote there in the middle of the, because um, one of your uh, dear friends and, and fellow host, Tim Apicella, you once sent out to cover that aspect of public space, which is public transportation. I love that show. It was Hawaii moving forward or something like that. And then unfortunately, uh, you know, he, well, fortunately, then you did something even more relevant, which is unfortunately that he even had to do it, which was called the Trump show. And then later on, America moving ahead or, you know, better like that something, you know, so that's, that's another side note of, again, of, of, of discourse, of public discourse, of public space and public transportation. Any of what, what kind of thoughts does this all trigger, Jay? Oh, many, many thoughts, Mark. The first thought is um, architectural criticism. You know, why do you want architectural criticism in a given market, in a given geographical area? And uh, I have a partial answer. You may have, uh, you know, another answer or more of an answer. Uh, let me say that if you criticize a building, you may not get a chance to criticize it until after it's in construction or built. Uh, and you may say, this is a terrible building. This does not contribute, you know, to the community, to the community feeling, to neighborliness, uh, to living together in this community, the quality of life. Um, because the quality of life includes the quality of aesthetic life. It includes the quality of public space life. It includes connecting with people. And there's always a, you know, a challenge to do that, especially around our time and COVID and all that. So we have to connect. Architecture allows us to connect. So the problem is that the architect, or rather the critic, architectural critic, he sees the building, it's too late. The building is already half built or fully built. What can he do? What's the point? And there is a point. And you can, you know, enlarge on this. The point is that it raises public awareness about architecture, about the good kind and maybe the not so good kind. And if he writes for the Star Advertiser or some other, you know, high circulation publication, people are going to know this is a bad building. And they're going to say, next time, ready, quote me, next time we can do better. And that's the purpose. That's, that's the essential goal and benefit of an architectural critic. Next time we can do better. And here's some standards, not only for other architects, of course, you know, we want that, but, you know, for the capital concentration, uh, for the developers, for the owners, for the people who instruct the architects. It gives the architects a stronger position in the negotiation of the design for that project. And so we need to have architectural critics, and we surely, absolutely, certainly need to have them here. We haven't had them here. Aside from you, you know, and maybe a couple of others around you, there isn't really much architectural criticism in Hawaii. And look around, and you'll see the result of that. Look at the university. You know, the word eclectic comes to mind, but, you know, how about junk? Junk also kind of comes to mind. And so what we need to have is some sort of um, identification, some kind of franchise in the state, some kind of statement about who we are, what we are, in the community, the physical community in which we live. I'm sorry we don't have that. Those are my thoughts. Absolutely. And you just made it happen because while this, uh... You know, weekly rhythm has to terminate, but uh, we have many slides, uh, many more slides to come, uh, basically illustrating what you just said. So um, I'm sorry to say there has to be an ad hoc add on to this discussion here because we won't make it through all the slide flesh uh, thoughts. So one step after the other and the perfect one perfect uh, illustration to what you just said. Next slide. Continue to use me, the architect, and me as a guinea pig, right? So architectural criticism sometimes has to hurt, but first of all, also sometimes it can sort of, you know, soothe or heal or sometimes even, you know, uh, make you feel good because also talking about the good things. So the article on the right was one of the many 
this project is sort of which for musicians is the main hit wonder, hopefully not the one hit wonder, but this is the project that most people associate us, me, in the world. And so it has been published all over the world, but this is a publication uh, still in uh, my own turf culture of Germany in its capital city. This is the Berliner Zeitung, so our new capital again, and their main newspaper, or one of their main newspapers. And it was an article that we, we thought we were so proud of it, so we delivered it to the lady that we saw, we talked about in the previous one, Uta bokov Ries, the head of the city planning department. And she was, uh, you know, kind of had mixed feelings about it, because although we were kind of the beneficiaries in this article, many of the other projects around the expo got slammed by this brave guy, Klaus Dieter Weiss. And so, um, yeah, she had mixed feelings about it. And she told me, uh, Martin, do you know uh, that I have never been taking um, a position and been fighting for an architect? as much as for you against that, you know, public transport client. And I said, I did not know, but I should have known. And I'm very, you know, happy and thankful. Speaking of thankful for that. Klaus Dieter Weiss um, is, is a unique uh, guy, really old school in that genre, because uh, first of all, he's a freelance guy. So he has to make a living. I have the highest respect for people. We talked about this before the show who don't have a regular payroll. Uh, you have a highest respect for that, too, because the underwriters, the donors were the regular payroll for us. And when that sort of, you know, shakes, that that is an existential issue. So for an architectural critic who walks around and tries to sell his articles to magazines, that is like Russian roulette, you know, on, on a daily basis. And that as to make a living is kind of really hard. So these guys are my real heroes. And I know from first experience, the show quote in the in the in the top left is about something we return to later, uh, maybe next time, as it looks like. Uh, that has to do with uh, the typology of of military, which is our second largest economy on the island. It, it also hardly ever we had many shows talking about it, actually shows addressing that, but the relation to the built environment is not that much addressed as it should be. So I once had completed a building in that genre that we will see later. And he, I, I tried to pitch it to him and I was saying, hey, isn't that nice to write about? And he said, let's see. So what he did is we got into his old car. We drove around half across the country. And this happened to be in the former uh, GDR uh, communist part that right after the reunification, we had this project out in the boondocks. So we drove for like half a day to finally get there. He actually did not write about it, go figure, whatever this meant, right? Um, but um, he wrote about, he wrote this book, the big book is a book about young coming German architects around the turn of the century. And he wrote this book. And once we were hanging out together and he was very depressed because he said, Martin, you know what? The ironic thing is what happened is that all these architects that I promoted with this book, through this book, they all got teaching gigs. They all have now a safe paycheck from a university, except me. <laughs> he said, I applied for history theory positions and no one wants me. And how tragic is that? Well, he didn't say that. I say that. It is very tragic because he is this amazing guy who has no fear. And we have a guy, we had a guy on the island that we try to get back to think tech. Um, we talk about him in the ad hoc add-on, that's Kurt Sandburn. These guys, you know, are our utmost heroes uh, pretty much in, in that area. You know, you raise an interesting question, and that is the question of the role of the School of Architecture and Associated Design Specialties. Engineering, I suppose, is one of them, um, you know, in, in the community. Uh, and my, my own feeling is that the School of Architecture, any School of Architecture, has to have outreach. It has to permeate the public conversation with discussion of uh, architectural criticism, and that's you know good criticism and bad criticism, but it's it's um, looking at and evaluating the architectural product, the designs uh, that are coming out of the professional community, um, and so the, the school of architecture should be everywhere. It should be writing in all of the media. Uh, it should be speaking in all of the media. Um, it should be taking positions that are interesting, you know, raw meat positions. Where your candor is is the governing force. Um, the problem is that the the default position 
is the capital concentration, the owner, um, and the manager for that matter, um, you know, the, the developer, um, they want to save money. They want to do value engineering. Um, they fly in the face of innovation. Uh, they, you know, they don't want it cool. They don't want it new. They don't want it um, connected with our real lives on the street and at home. And if we are going to have a decent city and a decent quality of life, we have to think about these things. We, we can't let the capital concentrations tell us how to live. We need the architects to tell us how to live. They have to be freed up. And architectural criticism will do that. A public awareness about the value of good architecture will do that. And the only question in Hawaii is whether it's too late. Uh, and I want to raise that with you. I mean, we don't have criticism really to speak of, except you and a, and a couple of others. Um, we need criticism, but these buildings are already built. Neil Abercrombie wanted to have, you know, a 30 story, or a, maybe it's a 40 story building in Kaka'ako. And he pretty much got that because the Department of Planning and Permitting let him do it. They didn't care about the, the signature of the city, the quality of life, the planning of the city with a capital P. Um, and so I don't know, we have to be conscious of that. Every single structure should be evaluated from the ground up, from the first plan, from the first concept. Is, does it fit in our city? Is it consistent with our way of life? Is this who we want to be? You know, and, and my concern is that if you, have, you build a 30-story condo and it's a sort of stick in the eye, a, a stick in the eye for the mountains and a stick in the eye for the sea, um, you can't get rid of it. It's there. It's got a useful life of hundreds of years. What are you going to do? Tear it down? Um, you know, in Singapore, they tear them down. When it gets old, they tear them down. You have to tear them down. Um, and so we, ha we, sh we have to do that now. But in any event, there are a lot of old, rotten neighborhoods in Hawaii. They have to be redeveloped. This is our big opportunity for new, cool, creative, innovative, you know, human level, human quality architecture. And we, we need, this is a certain emergence here, Martin. We have to do this now, because if we don't do it now, we're going to find a lot of 40-story condos. Um, I, I don't mind, you know, building up. We have to do that just for the, the lack of space. But we can do it in a much better way than what happened in Kaka'ako. Absolutely. The, the timer counts us down. So we're at the end of this exciting 28 minutes. But needless to say, you offered in exceptional cases, some ad hoc add-ons. So this needs to be one, right? We need to talk about, continue to talk about that. And I take you up on your provocation. What role uh, does the School of Architecture, my School of Architecture play? So that should be then that the beginning where we pick up from next time. Thanks, Jay, for the discourse, as always. Much appreciated. So see you back for that. And until then, everyone stays constructively critical, critically constructive. Bye-bye. Aloha. We want to announce that ThinkTech Hawaii is moving into a new phase and will not be producing regular talk shows after April 30th. We will retain our website and YouTube channel and will accept new content on an ad hoc basis. We are also developing a legacy archive program to provide continuing public access to our content. If you can help us cover the costs of the transition and the development of our legacy archive program, please make a donation on thinktechaway.com. Thanks so much. Aloha.